more educational resources, like our medical ID cards, check out medicalbasics.com. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about my approach to acute pancreatitis and just a broad overview of the video. It's going to be talking about the general diagnosis. How would you diagnose acute pancreatitis? How do you grade it? The different etiologies and also the utility of imaging and also these various prognostic tools. So the first thing is going to be about diagnosis. And I think the most important aspect of this is that diagnosis really requires two of the three of the following things. So one would be the very classic story of persistent epigastric pain. Next would be having a lipase or amylase greater than three times the upper limit. And finally, some type of imaging finding, whether it be on CT, MRI, or ultrasound. Not saying that you would do all of these, but just if you were to find some type of evidence of acute pancreatitis on any of these, that would uh, qualify for one of the three of these diagnostic criteria. So I think the most important aspect of this is that Acute pancreatitis can largely be a clinical diagnosis. If you only require two of these and you have a persistent epigastric pain and you have this elevated lipase or amylase, depending on, and obviously this depends on the practice that you're in, but in general, you actually don't need imaging to actually have that definitive diagnosis. Likely, you're probably still going to get imaging, but if you really just want a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, it's really a clinical diagnosis. You can find out all this information just based on a clinic and labs by itself. Definitely there's a purpose of imaging and I think that oftentimes we'll get imaging even though based on these criteria we don't necessarily need it but I think it's just a good um, just educational point to think about that acute pancreatitis is mainly a clinical diagnosis. So the next thing is going to be about grading. So grading, you can think of acute pancreatitis in three broad categories, being mild, moderate, and severe. Essentially, you're going to divide between mild and moderate or severe based off evidence of end organ damage. So mild is going to be no evidence of end organ damage. Moderate is going to be end organ damage that it really only lasts less than 48 hours. And then severe is going to be persistent end organ damage greater than 48 hours. And this is based off of a clinical uh, criteria as well as just based off of labs as well. For example, like a lactate um, will show evidence of end organ damage, but also just a clinical thing as well. So that's really how you're going to divide between mild and moderate or severe um, for acute pancreatitis. The next thing is going to be um, what are the different etiologies? And we'll talk about the different causes in a second, but I want to make a quick point about what are the major etiologies for acute pancreatitis. And I think the first thing and the most important thing is what are the two most common causes of acute pancreatitis? And that's going to be gallstones and alcohol. And so why that's such an, an important point is that if 80% of the individuals have acute pancreatitis due to gallstones or alcohol. That means that because gallstones is so prevalent for acute pancreatitis that they are going to absolutely need some type of right upper quadrant ultrasound as well as LFTs. Because they're getting a likely cause of their pancreatitis is going to be due to these gallstones, you want to find the source and you want to know if that's in fact the cause. Because if you just treat the acute pancreatitis and you let things go and you didn't image them, then they can come back weeks, months, years, and they were just having these recurring gallstones. And so if fact that this was the cause, you're going to have to treat the gallstones. So I think that that's why imaging is so important. That Well, I mentioned before that imaging just in general of pancreatitis, I mentioned it's a clinical diagnosis. But the one thing that I want to make an exception is that in addition to imaging being useful just to have that definitive diagnosis, it's also extremely useful to get a right upper quadrant ultrasound in specific because of the prevalence of gallstones in acute pancreatitis. So that's one thing that you always have to make sure of. And the other was just idiopathic causes, very, very common. So other etiologies of acute pancreatitis is going to be, and I'm just going to kind of go through these very quickly, of one, some type of mechanical, some type of obstruction, like in cancer, toxic, always on the boards, especially during step one. You always remember scorpion, but how often that happens, unless you're endemic area of scorpions, probably not all that much, organophosphate. So always think about farmers and who have acute abdominal pain, who are 
being exposed to these insecticides or herbicides, if you see that on some type of clinical vignette, that's something to think about. Metabolic, so having some type of hypertriglyceridemia in regards to genetic disorders, drugs like thiazides, mumps, trauma like an ERCP, and just other types of genetic diseases like in cystic fibrosis. Next thing, like I mentioned before, what is the utility of imaging? I mentioned before that really it's a clinical diagnosis, but oftentimes you're going to see that everybody is going to get imaged for this. And typically it's going to be some type of CT or ultrasound. Um, ultrasound extremely useful to detect gallstones and also to also detect uh, more later complications like pseudocysts or abscess are going to be the complications that you have to always remember for acute pancreatitis prognostic tools, there's different criteria. And so I think the important thing with each of these is that there's so many different tools that you can utilize. I always plug it into MDCalc to give some type of prognostic score because I think oftentimes, especially if you're, let's say you're a medical student and you're trying to give a presentation, it's always good as much as possible to give some type of prognostic tool or some type of tool that tells you how sure you are that this in fact is this particular disease or this puts them at risk for another disease or this puts them at risk for mortality or um, something else. So the main point that I want to put across is that even though there's many of these, what's the most important thing is that you use one and stick with it, but also just understanding kind of what goes into the calculator. I think that's actually the most important part rather than the actual equation or calculation itself. So just for education, we're going to be looking at the Ranson criteria. And the Ranson criteria is essentially broken down into two components. One is based off of your admission, either labs or data. And then within 48 hours, you're going to have another set of labs or data and the changes that you'll see. And I think the important part is what does the Ranson criteria actually show you? What do all these scores show you? And I think it's two parts. One is it's going to be about the likelihood of actually having the disease but also and probably more importantly is the mortality. What is the likelihood that you're going to have some type of very big adverse event or having some type of mortality at the end of it? So I think that one on admission what you're going to be looking at I think a lot of these are, are fairly intuitive is having a higher white blood cell count, having being older, having a higher glucose, AST, LDH. Um, these are all going to predispose you to having higher mortality rate. And then within 48 hours, if you're having a large hematocrit drop from your admission, greater than 10%, having a BUN that increases by five from admission, having a, a calcium that's low, a, an oxygen saturation of, that's low, a base deficit that's high and, and requiring a lot of fluids. And I think all of these are fairly intuitive. If you think about it, it's, it's hard to just remember them. So that's why I think it's very important that one, you just kind of have this broad overview of what is going to preclude someone to having a higher mortality after having pancreatitis, but also just knowing where to look this all up. So best resource is just going to go to MDCalc, plug all these in, plug all the details that you at least have, and having some type of Ranson score on admission. And then within 48 hours, especially if you're giving some type of presentation, I think that is extremely critical, not only for pancreatitis, but just in general. Okay, so that's generally how I approach acute pancreatitis. Um, and I think it's good to just have some type of general framework and in, in how you would approach it. Be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our progress notebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.